Yeah. We're live now. How many miles? Welcome to the Hampton Beach Village District monthly meeting. It's <laughs> December 14, 2016. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before the meeting, and uh, I, I, I made a request last month that we wouldn't have another one of these, uh, but we're going to have to take a moment of silence. Uh, Rocky Gorin passed away this week. We'll take a moment of silence. Hmm? Yeah. So we'll take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Jason, I don't know, uh, we have Jason, we have Rayanne, and, and we have Julie, and we're going to talk about uh, the floodplains and all the things that are happening. Good evening, uh, my name is Jason Bashan. I'm the town planner here in Hampton, and I'm here with uh, Rayanne Dion, our conservation coordinator, and Julie LeBranch from the Rocky Hand Planning Commission. And we're going to provide an update this evening on the CRS grant program that we had been working on. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of an overview um, for everybody. Some of this information you, you've heard, but just to give you an overview of the project and the, and the, the community rating system itself. Uh, Julie's going to talk about the findings from the project, and then Rayan will talk about the next steps and beyond. Um, in 2015, the town of Hampton received a grant from the Piscataqua Regional Estuary Partnership to assess Hampton's eligibility to apply for the Community Rating System program. And as an overview of the, the Community Rating System, it um, was implemented in 1990 as a voluntary program for recognizing and encouraging community floodplain management activities exceeding the minimum NFIP standards. Any community in full compliance with the minimum NFIP floodplain management requirements may apply to join CRS. Under the CRS, flood insurance premium rates are discounted to reward community actions that meet the three goals of the CRS, which are, one, to reduce flood damage to insurable property, two, strengthen and support the insurance aspects of the NFIP, and three, encourage a comprehensive approach to floodplain management. Um, and as far as the CRS is, there are um, six prerequisites to applying to filing that application, which was the, the scope of uh, the intent of this uh, project. Um, those six prerequisites are one, National Flood Insurance Program participant, the community being that for at least one year. Full compliance with the minimum NFIP requirements, that's number two. Three, maintain FEMA elevation certificates. Four, review the repetitive loss properties list provided by FEMA and create and map repetitive loss areas. Five, retain flood insurance policies on town-owned land in flood, ha flood hazard zones. And six, include the limit of moderate wave action on the final adopted flood insurance rate maps. And a majority of our project time was focused on the repetitive loss prerequisites because the town of Hampton has over 40 repetitive loss properties spread along the coastline and tidal marshes. Any community with more than 10 repetitive loss areas must complete additional prerequisite activities such as repetitive loss area analysis, analysis and plans, as well as a public outreach program. Um, and as part of that process, the first mapping round utilized the four-foot sea level rise scenario from the Tides to Storms Vulnerability Assessment from 2015 to identify areas at high risk to flooding, which created very large repetitive loss areas. Um, once we went to that training in Biddeford, Maine, a four-day CRS training course, we realized that that was not the best approach and selecting 2,000 plus property owners would be cost prohibitive. And we re refocused our mapping effort to include only those properties with similar elevation characteristics or known flooding history and risks as each repetitive loss property, which created 12 areas totaling just over 400 properties. And I know Julie will get into that a bit more. Um, as far as the uh, discounts that can be um, realized from being in the uh, CRS program, uh, there is a class system made up that starts with 10 and goes to 1. Um, it's based on a point system, and for each 500 points you earn, you increase the class level. So with each class increase, 
you receive additional 5% off those premiums. So if we enter a class nine, that's 500 points that are needed for that, and you get a 5% reduction. A class eight would be 1,000 points needed for that, a 10% reduction, and so forth. And as part of the project, we prepared a CRS checklist to evaluate eligible points and determine which class rating the town may be able to achieve. And we found a number of noteworthy areas where we can gain considerable points. At this point, I'll turn it over to Julie. I know she'll talk about some of those areas and so forth on that. So, yeah. Don't go too far. I'm sure we have questions. Yep. We're, just, we're just kind of tag teaming here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I wanted to uh, just spend my time talking a little bit about what the um, some of the results of this of the uh, of this activity for applying for the CRS program have been. And one of them is looking at uh, again revisiting that CRS checklist. So the checklist is all about the series of activities that fall under six or seven cat different categories of activities that the, the community can do to gain points in the CRS program. Um, and we are pretty confident based on the results of that preliminary checklist and our estimations of the number of points that the town will be eligible for that we'll, we're going to probably, I think we're pretty confident we may reach over a thousand points which would actually get, bring us to a class A rating. Um, particularly right now the town has a warrant article uh, an, or an article that's going to a warrant for, uh, to uh, approve revised floodplain standards. Um, including um, a free board requirement or requiring substantial re improvements or new construction to be elevated one foot above the base flood, which is the, one, the, the elevation of the 100-year storm event. So that will actually gain, also gain points, a, a significant amount. So we're pretty confident that we, we probably, definitely a nine, but there's a high probability of, of reaching that eight, that eight rating of eight, which would allow um, NFIP policyholders to have a 10% discount in their, their annual insurance premium. So I want to kind of go through some of the uh, what some of the activities that gain the highest number of points under that under that checklist, and one of them is conserving land in the floodplain. And Hampton's done a pretty good job of doing that, and also of, of acquiring what they call salt, salt marsh parcels, parcels that are completely all wetland or marsh, and are either difficult or impossible to build on. So they've been getting donations of those parcels, taking them off the tax rolls, and um, if the town actually take, takes the uh, initiative to uh, pass a resolution to put those those parcels in permanent protection. Those will all count towards conserved land and will really gain us a <coughs> number of points. And the points are based on the number of acres of conserved land. So the more acres, the more points you get. Um, and that would be worth a, a several hundred points, I think, uh, based on what they have, what, what we have now that's conserved in the floodplain. Um, other er things that that have come. Um, been prepared, uh, tools that have been prepared and information that has been prepared over the last couple of years is also going to be able to gain points. So having the tides to storms vulnerability assessment, looking at the sea level rise scenarios and the storm surge scenarios and evaluating what's at, at risk, that all is, goes towards um, flood information and gets points. Um, the development by the coastal program here in New Hampshire of the new coastal viewer, which is an online GIS system, which displays all of this for public access, also get, gives, gives the town points because that, that's publicly accessible. It allows someone to go in and make a map with it and show tech, tax parcels and all that on, and, and flood, flood elevations on those maps. And then the town's own GIS-based floodplain information um, and data is also going to get points. And that the town had already had a, a pretty a pretty good and consistent outreach um, uh, uh, plan, providing information about flood insurance and flood risks to property owners by putting information in public facilities like the library and the town hall. So uh, those are that's actually an area that where that we could actually improve upon and, and get more points to do uh, doing outreach. So additional additional points um, under the CRS will be I, I think I already covered the first bullet. If that warrant article does pass and that amendment with the free board. Um, it gets passed, that will actually gain quite a, you know, more points in the, in, in, the, in the long run. And again, if the town does the resolution to permanently protect those salt marsh parcels, that would be a big thing. That I don't think it's something that has to go to a vote. I'm, we're, not, we're not sure yet whether the Board of Selectmen can do it or if it has to go on the warrant article um, yeah. for the following year. Yeah, yeah I can talk about that. Okay. 
Um, and so a couple of other activities that the town might want to consider doing and, and requiring as part of um, their maybe their site plan review and their subdivision regula regulations is to pro prohibit any kind of fill in the 100-year floodplain. Oh, it says 10-year. I'm sorry. It should say 100-year. <laughs> that's a typo. Um, that's, that's, again, a very specific act activity that, that FEMA will give points for for not filling because what that does is it, it, it preserves the amount of flood storage that's actually in the 100-year floodplain. Just like when you have a, a bucket of water, if you add a bunch of rocks to it, the water level goes up, basically. So the more you fill and you, you, you take away that flood storage, the water's going to go elsewhere. And you, you actually increase the overall level of flooding in, in an area. Um, another area to, to consider is to improve best practices to maintain drainage infrastructure better and to maintain water courses and drainage drainage courses where flood waters, whether it's um, from the ocean or if it's from you know extreme precipitation during a storm event, that those um, those pathways for, for, for drainage are kept open and clear. A lot of times, you, everyone that probably have seen this, if you have a wetland or a small stream in your backyard, it's the area you always put your brush pile and all your stuff, and you just pile it up, and those things get clogged, and they, they don't function very properly, and they can actually back up and cause more flooding. So if, you act, if the town actually would to codify, write these procedures down, create a plan for, for ex examining and, and inspecting these drainage ways every year, and had a dedicated staff person. So it would require the town to adopt a plan to, to actually, uh, you know, to implement this kind of program, probably through the Department of Public Works. The town and does it, that now. They do some of it. They do. They definitely maintain their drainage infrastructure, but it's not something that's written down in a, in a, in a formal plan. It's just something they do as part of their practice. Okay. So what, what they FEMA would want them to do is to actually write up a little um, a small plan that says this is how often we do it, here's where, well, how we do it, here's the staff we have dedicated to do it, um, that kind of thing. So if they just formalize the process. We don't have the staff. Pardon? We don't have the staff. Right. So that's the other, right, if you don't have staff to actually go out and do the inspection. So that's... If it's already, if it's already something that's being done, maybe they just need it written down. Yes. Yep. Because it might be something that... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, because when, when uh, FEMA comes in and does their visit and reviews the, the checklist, we have to provide do documentation of each of the elements we're, we're claiming credit for. So if it's not written down somewhere, it, it, you, you, can't, you can't attach the documentation. So Actually, um, there's money budgeted. The, the $60,000 for public works, it's not, it doesn't have to do with um, stormwater management. Or actually, it does. It, because remember, we have to, they're going to have to measure. The whole $60,000 that's been in use this year? Yes, that the, the the federal government is um, is making them check and test the stormwater at, at multiple. Um, yeah, actually, I think I'm going to. Is there is it a Warren article, Regina, or was it just something in the budget? I don't what remember. What we did, we increased the line in the budget because there was something in the. Uh, Coming down the pike, that the federal government said it's going right, to be. it's going to be probably. It's already been implemented. It's in Massachusetts. Massachusetts and it's, by the end of next year, it'll be implemented, it'll be implemented here. here as well. It's the EPA MS4 stormwater permit. That's the one. Yes. Right. So does that kind yes. of mix in with this? You could actually, if you have, if you have to create an inspection program for that permit, you can take credit for it under the under this this program. Okay. So there we go. We're actually going to be doing that next Good. year. Great. Okay. Um. And then lastly, I think I mentioned this before, but doing more public outreach and engagement, um, that's, an, it's, it's a, that's a fairly low co cost and very local thing to do, and I think it only benefits the community and it helps property owners and businesses become more informed. And it's definitely something we've talked about expanding, and, and we, we did provide, we actually created a couple of new fact sheets and informational pieces. But by using you know multiple m sources of media, whether it's um, creating a Facebook page or um, doing some more ac active you know, notices and, and informational pieces on cable television, uh, doing having a booth at, at public at pit public um, um, events like the like the seafood festival, having a stormwater in a you know flood risk you know ha flood hazards booth or something, um, but trying to engage the community and, and getting them. The more you, the more messages you put out every year, you, th you would think that one message might be enough. But the more times people hear this stuff and re remind of, I'm reminded of it, you know, reinforcement is always a good thing. So um, beefing up the outreach and engagement is probably a good idea. Any questions before I go on to the second part? Yes. Do you have a message board prepared or a poster or something? Because I certainly have the place to put it. Oh, where's that? The Discovery Center right across. Right oh, yes. 
Um, well, we have a uh, we have a fact sheet which could be very easily turned into a lar large format poster. It says "Know Your Flood Hazard" on it, and it talks about all the different types of hazards and what can what property owners can do to alleviate flood or you know to be aware of flood ha I mean, fl flood I can risks. Display that. Sure. And if that would help. Yeah, that would help. Okay, so we'll talk. Right. So the so the way the CRS assigns credit, you have you can you can get credit for multiple messages if the message is posted in, in, in multiple places. So if you had a, a, seri a sign that you had multiple signs and you put them in different parts of the beach, you get credit for each one of those locations. Um, so something like that would, would, would get get credit, definitely. And more than that, I'll even have people talk about it. Sure. So that's even more engaging. Yeah, exactly. It'd be kind of cool if it actually had sort of like a, if you had a way to have an audio, you know, next to it somehow that would play a, like a like a, a tape or something that like told people a story about, you well, know, give it flood. To me. So, yeah, there are lots of ways to, to really maximize the number of points you can get for the engagement part. And what FEMA, you know, the whole goal behind that is just public awareness, and it's, it's having property owners, be, especially those who, who have flood insurance policies, to become more prepared and know what their options are. So um, I think that Rianne and, and Jason will definitely be moving forward um, on, on that um, in the future. So behind this memo, you have uh, two maps, and these are the re these are the repetitive loss area maps that we've prepared as part of the CRS project. And I just wanted to kind of show you. I know they're a really small for format. I decided rather than print one big one, which you wouldn't be able to see very very well from far anyway, I I'd print small ones. And so what we did was we looked at the the actual properties that that had repetitive you know insurance claims, and looked at the areas around these properties, and just looked at the beaches in general to see where the lowest lying areas which would be most susceptible to flooding were. And as Jason mentioned, what we did, we used as a guide are, um, you see the green parts of the map, uh, the little shaded green parts? That's the, that's, that shows you the 4.0 the foot um, contour that's the, of, for sea level rise. The tan colors that you see in the blue are, are all salt marsh. You can see the, the windy patterns of the creeks that go through the salt marsh. But as peeking out behind that, are those green areas, and those green areas represent the lowest lying areas topographically here at the beach. And you'll notice that the repetitive loss areas are outlined in purple. And you'll notice that in, mo in most cases, in many instances, especially along the back part of, of the beach, they correspond with those green areas because those are low lying. And, and when we have the highest annual tides and when we have storms come in, the water comes in through the estuary and backs up against the back part of that beach. And everyone knows that those all those properties to the west of um, Ashworth Avenue are those the, the, the prime areas where you see the first the, the first stages of flooding and the most frequent flooding. The other areas are on, other areas that are recognized here are on the east side of um, Route One A, and those for the most part, um, some of them are especially in the, in the on page the second page the nor the northern part are very close and right they're, they're beachfront properties and they're very susceptible to wave action and flooding from from storms. And then you'll see some other ones, especially the ones that are on the south, the south map that are down past, um, can't read the names of the streets, but as you're approaching the, the, yeah, the, the approach to, to go over the bridge and then over the bridge into Seabrook where you have a little slice of land. Yeah, a lot of those, those, those properties actually are susceptible to stormwater flooding. So the streets there are, they, they kind of tip up as they go towards the beach, you know, close to the water, they kind of go up a little bit. And the, then this, the middle section is very low. And in many cases, we saw storm drains um, that were immediately adjacent to driveways that went down, sloped into someone's garage underneath their house. Or you just you can just you can see that when stormwater ponds in those areas, it flows right down into those those spaces. And so those um, were flagged as being more problematic for flooding for freshwater flooding during during um, strong precipitation events. And also. During, especially if they occur during a storm or, or at high tide. So there's a variety of different, oh, and also the other, you can see there are some properties, um, especially along, and help me the names, I'm blanking out. The names of the roads here. Back behind where we are, up behind Brown Avenue, and then what's, uh, Kings Highway? The Kings Highway properties there, there's a, there's a cluster on either end of Kings Highway. And those, those properties are snugged right up against um, large expanses of, of marsh in, in back of them. And they're, they're, they're so low-lying there. And in some cases, the, if, if you cross the road and you go to over to the other side of the road, you're actually lower than the surface of the marsh. So these are properties that are just, because they're so close and they're at, at or below the elevation of the marsh, they're, gonna, they're going to flood very, very frequently. 
And in some cases, there, there was one pod, and I can't identify it right now, that's actually adjacent to a, a freshwater wetland. It's isolated wetland, but these properties surround that wetland, and when that fills up, you can definitely see that some of these are older buildings that aren't elevated, that they could definitely be susceptible to flooding. So that's the, sort of the methodology that we use to identify the repetitive loss areas based on the different characteristics of flooding, some of them being freshwater, some of them being direct ocean, you know, tide, I mean, wave action, and others being, you know, inundation from the, from the marsh side. Um, so we're going to put, be putting together a report, or we're going to be finishing it shortly, um, that catalogs and each one of these areas will have a number and we'll have all the properties that are involved in that, in that area or are located in that area. And we'll, the, the report will describe what I just described, what the primary flood threats are in the, each one of them, and identifying ways to reduce or eliminate those, those, those flood hazards, basically, whether it's through stormwater management retrofits or um, those property owners um, creating berms even in front of people's driveway so that the water does not go, it, it flows into the street instead of going down into someone's driveway. Um, and then, um, I think I covered the rest that's in the memo. And so it'll have fo photographs. We took photographs, Rianne and, and, and Jason and I went out over a series of two to three days. We took photographs of all the areas. We cataloged in notes in a, in a spreadsheet what we, what we observed. We observed where, where properties were not elevated, older older homes and older pieces of uh, a property that were, weren't elevated at all. They were really just kind of, kind of at grade level and others that were elevated and had been improved. So they had to actually raise their foundations up. So we have a good, good idea of the sort of the mix of, of building types that are in each one of the areas as well. Um, so that's sort of going to be the repetitive loss area plan. And that is a prerequisite to actually applying to the CRS. And, and basically what, what that is, is it's, it's to try and get a handle on ways to um, help the repetitive proper, lost properties themselves, and there's about 40 of those in town, and Rayanne's going to talk about that, to um, recognize what the problems are, try to alleviate them. There could be some very simple fixes, actually, that will really help to improve or reduce the amount of flooding that these properties see over time. But it really acts as sort of a guide for the community to try and reduce the number of, of, of claims in a given year and to reduce, um, f especially that, re that frequent kind of nuisance kind of flooding. Because we know that looking at these, these neighborhoods and going around looking at the properties that there are probably, uh, probably a lot of properties that don't have flood insurance. They're not part of the NFIP. And they probably experience repetitive damage, but they just don't have, re they don't have claims to show, a claim record to show, to show for it. So that's why we, we sort of, when we define the areas, we, we, grouped, we grouped them all together based on the, the common characteristics. Um, so if we saw a low-lying area, we included all the, all the properties that might be affected by that kinds of flooding and all the, all the properties that are adjacent to the marshes and those that are actually oceanfront that are very, very exposed due to the fact that they have very low-lying either revetments or retaining walls in front of them that could be very easily be overtopped during a storm. Um, so that's my part. Does anyone have any questions? I think it's interesting that <clears throat> last night there was a full moon, and then this morning, um, I don't know exactly what the high, when the high tide was, but usually two hours after the high tide is when you'll get the, the peak of the flooding in the marsh. Mm -hmm. Today, that occurred around 10.30 in the morning, and I don't know, Kathy, was it the king high tide again? Yes, was it another it king? Okay, because the, and there was just enough wind coming from the west that it was pushing the water as well. And there was extreme flooding today at 10.30 in the morning. And again, yeah. later, yes, actually, yes, you're right, because it, we had flooding in Exeter at Swayze, in Swayze Parkway at 2.30 when I was coming to about 2 o'clock, no, 2 o'clock-ish, or something like that, or a quarter to 2, when I was coming from back from a meeting. The, it was actually over the wall of, of, of the Swanscott River, yeah. which which in the, in the king, king tide back in November, that didn't happen. That's so, yes. exactly right. It didn't happen in November when they were talking about the moon being so close yeah. to the uh, earth yeah. and all of that. But this particular, and the, we didn't have a storm. Yeah. Oh, it was very, very still today. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it was... Um, very, very high. And it was one very of the high. other things that you mentioned, the pro prohibit fill in the 100-year flood plan, every time they build one of these five-story buildings, but they're, they're just finishing a project right now next to Ron's Landing. It's a huge building, two huge buildings. And the, the way the hydrology works is that when you put a big building like that, <clears throat> it pushes down and everything else comes up. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. that, that's just engineering, correct, Jason? 
it's just basic engineering where you put these big, big, it's, you know, just imagine it's the same thing with a bucket of water, throw a rock in it. Well, you push it, it down and the, and the marsh is like a sponge. Yep. It's going to make it rise. And so building all these big buildings and they're not done yet. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> they're no, I'm definitely done. not. You know? <clears throat> well, the whole idea about the, the prohibiting the fill, too, is that it disproportionately favors single properties. So if someone never improves their property and they keep it the way it is, you know, everyone around them has filled their, their lot to make it higher, where do you think the water's going to go? It's going to go to the, the, low, the, area, the pr properties that haven't been filled. And so unless there's a comprehensive movement, an agreement, or whatever to, for a whole neighborhood to comprehensively fill and elevate their, their buildings, it, it, it acts disproportionately, you know, to, to favor some properties versus others. And so um, that's, that's why that FEMA re recommends that. Um, same idea about stormwater too that you know the, over the last five years there's been a real push for people to own their stormwater if you generate it on your property you keep it on your property you don't you don't push it on into the municipal system you don't push it onto somebody else's property if you generate it you should manage it they actually passed the warren article a few years ago that the surface mm -hmm. area there's a certain percentage that has to be um what is the percentage now is it 15 percent or is it higher than that that it has to be permeable. Coverage. How much? It's um, so it used to be 85 percent across pretty much all the zones, with the exception being the off protection zone. And a few years ago, we had it reduced from 85 percent down to 60 percent, um, with the exception of the business and business seasonal, which was at 75. Okay. So that's still pretty high numbers, though. Yeah, <laughs> but they, they already some <coughs> so it's doing that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So when this plan is done, uh, 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 the, the planners will take it to the Board of Selectmen for its, for its adoption. Um, and, and some of the recommendations hopefully will be, in, I, I imagine we'll probably maybe have a public meeting and send it out for comment for everyone who may be part of the solutions that are identified in it. So there'll be some, be some, some input by the department heads on the beach. The obvious question is uh, an estimate of when the plan will be done. Oh, um, I, I was just waiting on some data and, and fin the finishing finishing up the mapping. So I, they'll, they should have it in their hands before the end of the year, and they'll probably make some tweaks to it. But um, it's going to have a, a spreadsheet, um, photographs, a, a PowerPoint series of photographs with notes on them, the actual plan itself, and lists of the dip, the, the lists of the areas and lists of which properties fall in each one of the repetitive loss areas. So that's what the, pl the plan will consist of, many s several parts. And what's the likelihood of being able mm -hmm. to apply for? the CRS in May, which is the next opportunity. That's the perfect segue to Rianne, <laughs> who's going to talk about what, what we do next. <laughs> okay. Oh, she had sent me an email. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Rianne Day. I'm the Hampton Conservation Coordinator. So I think you can see that we've certainly made some um, good strides over the last year. It was a pretty um, intense program to, to take on on top of our other daily stuff but uh, we did make good progress and we certainly want to keep that momentum going so um so it's good that we have the the checklist done we've got um a good idea of where we stand point wise um the one kind of missing element um is we need a, a letter of good standing from the nfip which is the national flood insurance program um, last year we had a review, they, they happen every five years, um, and um, we have a few uh, non-compliance issues that have to be evaluated and uh, mitigated before we'll get our letter of good standing. So a majority of that work is falling with the building department, um, but we will certainly, Jason and I will assist where we can. But. Unfortunately, that is one of the six prerequisites for applying, and so until we have that letter in hand, um, our application to the CRS program has to be uh, delayed. Um, but once we do get that uh, letter of good standing, we will certainly move forward, and you know we'll um, work. One of the ways that we'll kind of keep things up to date is we're you know going to keep an eye on our repetitive loss properties. It's a list that's generated by FEMA, so. Um, we will make sure that our repetitive loss analysis is up to date. If for some reason there's a new repetitive loss property that's added, we will have to uh, make changes to that to keep it up to date. Uh, we'll also be tracking any of our um, lands that are conserved so that we can keep that number up to date. As uh, Julie commented, that is 
one place that we can uh, earn a lot of points. Um, I personally will be working on, um, you guys may be aware that there is, um, I forget the date when it was passed, but it was in the, in the 90s that there was a warrant article that passed that said any um, tax lien parcels that are in the salt marsh, the Board of Selectmen are required to take them and um, put them, kind of give them to the Conservation Commission. Um, which is great for our open space uh, conservation. One of the things that FEMA requires is that they know that they're going to be protected in perpetuity. So those deeds don't say that in them, um, but it certainly seems possible that if we make a list of those uh, salt marsh parcels or other wetland parcels, um, we could put together a warrant article, um, probably for 2018, that says you know these ones that we um, have we want them to be protected in perpetuity so that we can have that to back up and make FEMA confident that they're, they're not going to be developed. Um, the, um, certainly there's a few things, um, you know, Jason and I are going to be supporting that um, floodplain ordinance revision that's going to include free board. We certainly would encourage people to, to vote in support of that. Free board. The, um, I believe it's, it's one foot over base flood elevation. Um, is what is being proposed. So we'd certainly hope that people would support that. That will generate uh, CRS um, points. Uh, the Conservation Commission has a warrant article um, <clears throat> for $20,000 to go into the conservation fund. That fund is used to acquire uh, open space land and conservation easements, um, all of which, if they're um, in the floodplain, will <clears throat> also gain CRS credit. Um, one of the other things that is critical to um, being successful in the CRS program is uh, tracking and reviewing our elevation certificates. Those are provided when a property is either redeveloped or substantially improved. And so one of the things that um, we'll also be working on is kind of developing a, a standard kind of operation of procedure of when they get view, reviewed and filed so that they're all kept in good shape and are uh, readily accept, uh, accessible. Uh, one of my goals is to hopefully have them um, available on the online GIS uh, system so that if you looked up a property, you'd actually be able to see it and, and view it. Um, one of the other things uh, we are excited about doing will be uh, partnering, partnering again with RPC. Um, they were just awarded a grant from the Coastal Program to do a uh, FEMA high watermark initiative. Um, this involves um, putting up um, signage um, where there have been some historical flooding events and kind of identifying that height. Uh, you put them in very public places and um, there's also some uh, kind of outreach that you do with that. So it's just kind of, again, another one of those visuals to kind of remind people, hey, in this area at a certain date, you know, the floodwaters were this high or this high, depending on, on where we are. So that program would also um, lend itself to some uh, points with the CRS. Um, some of you are at the um, Coastal New Hampshire Coastal Risk and Hazard Commission's um, kind of uh, overview of their report that just came out. That uh, report has 35 uh, recommendations in it that kind of deal with um, storm surge and um, uh, sea level rise and uh, extreme uh, precipitation events. So we'll certainly be looking at those type of recommendations and seeing how they might uh, align with some of um, FEMA's CRS credible activities. And if there's some alignment, we'll certainly want to pursue those. Um, and then I think once we are in the CRS program, we certainly uh, anticipate having a website that's dedicated to that program that would have resources and tools available for um, residents to go and uh, take a look and uh, learn more about it. So. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the building department has apparently an important piece to play. They do. To, you've got the points, but you can't even apply to use those points until other things are done? Correct. Um, what's your estimate of how long it will take the building department to do its piece? I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, the the noncompliance issues vary. Some, I think, are... Um, very easy to correct. There's a few that might be a little more challenging, so it'll kind of depend on um, how willing the prop how willing the property owners are to to correct the issues. Um, but it is a requirement from the NFIP to to follow it. Uh, we have to take all steps necessary to, to get it get them in compliance. So. So you're saying at the end of the day, if some property owner doesn't agree to do something, all this is for naught. Hopefully that won't happen. But I mean. Certainly, it could be. There's a chance that that could happen. Yeah. But. Is 
something to make them do it? Is it is it something that is it? Um. Well, certainly we we would need to contact them and educate them about what needs to happen. And like I said, hopefully, um, you know, like one instance is they um, their flood vents um, they have to be a certain size and they they need to be a little bit bigger. So hopefully the person will be amenable to correcting that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's always the chance that it's not, and if they don't, then um, enforcement action has to be taken. So um, <coughs> I've not been involved in, in <laughs> how that has gone. Um, so hopefully it goes smoothly, but I don't know. Has that process been started with the individuals? Um, I know that uh, there's been some back and forth with FEMA, and I know that Kevin, uh, they generated a list, and that Kevin went out and visited the properties to verify, because. <clears throat> FEMA was looking at it from the elevation certificate, so actually going out and seeing the property makes a big difference, and you know maybe it was just an error on the elevation certificate. Um, so I know that Kevin did go out, uh, visit each of the properties, and I think there were a few that were able to be removed from the list, but there's still uh, a few that need to be investigated a little bit more. But I, I haven't asked him what where he is in reaching out to those property owners yet. Well, is there a time frame for this? Um, for correct doing correcting those those ones that are non-compliance, uh, FEMA FEMA says as long as you're working on it and you know putting effort to to work with people, um, they don't have a deadline. Okay. So, yeah. So there we're not in right. So no one we're not in at this point we're not in any in in any danger of being kicked out of the NFIP. So they'll work with us and it's not. It seems a little bit alarming, um, but it's not something that other communities don't also face as they go through this process. So um, I know that um, Rye had some non-compliance issues, and um, they've been working to correct them. So it does happen elsewhere. We're, we're not unique. Do either one of you guys know uh, the hundred-year foot, the new plans, or if they're, where they are about being certified? What dates? So we have anything on that? It's another the maps, the new maps. The um, the uh, Office of Energy and Planning is kind of the direct contact for kind of our our state contact for knowing where things stand with the few maps. And um, right now, they're they're saying the earliest would be uh, late spring, early summer of 2017. But um, yeah, it could be later than that. Enter so. Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's tough because it, um, again, there were some. Um, appeals to it and they have to work through that and they don't really give you much information on where they stand they just keep bumping the the expected um so release they'll, date they'll be ready to do the next 10 years <laughs> hopefully it's not it's been two years then if that's I know, the case I know. That's it has been a while yeah because we thought it was going to be September of last year and, and it's been bumped so I understand it's, uh, so one thing to add about the repetitive loss I mean the, um, the non-compliant properties is that you know the, the, the last resort is after trying to negotiate with And they were part of the review team too, so they they Has involved. the building department taken advantage of that opportunity yet? It only just happened a couple months ago, right? The review, but the results. Yeah, yeah. Ago, so I think still I know there's just been emails back and forth of yeah. kind of like, this is the list that we got. Can you go ground truth it? And then he got back to them, and then I think the list got dwindled a little bit, and then I'm not sure where they are in that next step. Yeah, that first process was to go out and actually inspect the properties and ground okay. truth whether what was on the certificate. <laughs> The next time we meet, could he come with you to kind of bring us up, up to date on what now is his piece in the process? Yeah. Kevin. If he's, we can certainly ask. Yeah. No, would you mm -hmm. ask him to come with you to where he's going? Sure. He, see, he seems to be a critical part, player now. Yes. I have a comment or a question, I'm not sure. The, um, I know properties here at the beach that 
at least one because I can look out my back window and see it. When that flood comes in on the marsh, the water goes right under the person's house. Yeah. They, they literally have to wear boots or hip boots or something just to get to the house. And the house is just high enough that somehow the water doesn't go into it in a yet. Right. Maybe someday it will, but it goes right under the house. Mm -hmm. And they can't, you know, it's... Well, a lot of the houses are designed that way. So, so that the apartments right on the beach, the American or something condos, yeah. USA, actually, USA condos, they open the garage doors, comes the water just the goes ocean, through. rolls out the yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, okay. it's not it's unique. It's not a unique yeah. thing. Or a floor. Okay. They certainly may want to look into elevating a bit more <laughs> if it's really, like, really close to the you know their first floor. But. Most elevated structures are um, are designed for the water to flow underneath mm -hmm. them, through or through them. So this That's is how this building, building is built. Yeah, this no, building this is set for water to go through the base. In this particular case, this is just a cottage that was built in the marsh, mm -hmm. and the water just goes under it, and it's just been that way for you know who knows a hundred years or something. But it's not illegal, correct? Um, not at the time that it was built. I mean, I doubt that you'd be able to build it well, today. Do a thing right, with it, right, right. So you know, um, it's interesting that Chris Jacob from the Department of Public Works was talking to us at the Budget Committee, and there are some of the streets on the west side of Ashworth. Um, they didn't. They weren't included in the sewer upgrade that happened in Hampton. Um, I don't know, 15 years ago was it now? And so they just discovered. He was telling us that um, there was one. One cottage that's out in the marsh, and the um, the pipe for the storage from the house had gotten disconnected from the pipe <laughs> that goes into the ground, and so um, it was a simple fix just to put it back to where it belonged. Remember when he mentioned this? But every time they'd have one of these tides, the water would just go in the pipe, and and he <laughs> pointed out that at the storage treatment plant, they treat I'm going to just take a number, uh, 700,000 uh, 700, gallons a day, yet the town only buys 300,000 from aquarium water. So all this, there's okay. all this extra water going into our... Right. Uh, well, I think that's part of why they got those, those, they've been putting man covers that seal to try to help that saltwater intrusion from getting into the wastewater treatment right, plant the, and the increasing covers. the volume that we treat. So this is interesting. Not just that one spot. interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on mm. in the water. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had one question. Um, you talk about the freeboard like one foot above the floodplain elevation. Um, is there one floodplain elevation for the whole town, or is that something that varies by it's lot to lot or area? It varies yeah. depending on the area. A lot of the town is based on elevation. Okay. How do I get them to? Yeah, it depends on which which okay. special flood hazard zone you're in. So there's D E A E A O. Um, <clears throat> you can come and talk to me, and we can look up your property, and I can send you away with a little slip that tells you where you are. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> yeah. They'd have to meet whatever. <clears throat> they would be with the current maps, what the current theme. So when they were talking about um, if the new maps have been adopted, we have current maps and we have preliminary maps. You can't build to the preliminary. They can't enforce the preliminary maps. You have to use the ones that are current. So they would be built to what's currently accepted. We certainly encourage. Okay. Right. I know I've spent time with property owners because um, I, I, the wetlands, our wetland conservation district, and um, a lot of these flood areas overlap quite nicely. Um, so oftentimes when I'll, I meet with people, we'll take a look at the preliminary maps just to see if there's a change because you might as well, It's if let's say the preliminary, your current map says <clears throat> a base flood elevation of nine, but in the preliminary maps, it's a base elevation of 10 and you're doing a teardown rebuild, it might be worth it to, to go to 10 and you know get yourself that, that extra. Um, but it's, it's voluntary to go above what the um, current maps require. Especially because in the meantime, while you're not in CRS, um, if, if any, any property owners are developing or doing substantial improvements, do it voluntarily. They will get an insurance rebate to mm -hmm. themselves for doing that very right. day. So there are ways that property owners can, can actually achieve the discount or a substantial discount on their own without being in the CRS program. Yeah. 
do think it's worth just. Sort of, that's sort of outrage and letting people know that you do have the option for a little bit more money and you're doing improvements to go above and beyond. Um, it's, it's really a, a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's I do think it's worth to point out that in the uh, floodplain ordinance where they talk about freeboard, where they're saying one foot above whatever uh, the base flood elevation, if you are, you're meeting that, the, the planning board does have a caveat in there for you to um, have one foot higher in your height, because we recognize that some people might be reluctant to do that one foot over base flood elevation because they might be bumping it up against the height restriction. Um, so the planning board said, okay, well, if you're elevating to meet that floodplain ordinance, so you can, yeah, you can take that one foot and put it on top of your building. So there's no, uh, you're not getting penalized for it. Yeah. So. Uh, kind of a global question. Beyond the CRS piece, there's the Sea Level Rise Commission report piece, which goes out for decades. And the DPW director says maybe two or three years from now, he will have in place the ability to start planning for that piece. Are you people kind of doing a little bit of that con uh, contaminant with the uh, C uh, CRS piece now? I am. You are? Uh, we've received a, um, the coastal program and um, cooperative extension, and should I go? Yeah, oh, the yeah. mic's probably better. Right, so the RPCs, the uh, Coastal Program, uh, Cooperative Extension, and the Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve received a, a NOAA grant, a project of special merit, which is a nationally competitive grant um, pro uh, program to do outreach for the Coastal Commission's report. So it consists of doing public workshops, uh, meeting with towns to advise them about the best recommendations in the re contained in the report that might help remedy some of their problems and alleviate flooding. Um, and then we're also going to be uh, giving Unfortunately, you had <laughs> you were you were the recipient of a tides to storms two grant, which you you got your floodplain ordinance rewritten for. But the, we're going to offer the same technical assistance to the inland coastal communities to do typical to uh, implement some of the recommendations from that report. But there'll definitely be some broad outreach, some workshops, some technical workshops, some audits of, of how what communities have on the books that that could be changed, policies and plans that could be changed, and ways that they can improve their um, their resilience and their reduce their risk of flooding. So that'll happen, start happening in the early, late winter, early part of the spring throughout all of next year. So we'll let you know when that happens. We definitely would like to target, a, you know, a, a workshop down at the beach here somewhere, um, maybe in Hampton or um, or Seabrook, depending on where we decide to have it. But So that our outreach will happen. So. And I guess to that effect, I can add that I know the Conservation Commission, uh, you know, each year we look at the Wetland Conservation District section of the ordinance and, you know, see if there's ways to uh, make improvements or provide clarity. So I certainly see the coastal risk and hazards um, document being something that we refer back to. And if there's a place or a recommendation that we can uh, fold into it and is appropriate, that we would, we would certainly mm -hmm. take a look at that. My concern would be that we go beyond the sustainability of the town infrastructure to the sustainability of the town. Um, and these are, they very much are in lockstep, but they're independent pieces. And the first thing any town would do is say, how do I protect the assets of the town, those that the town owns? The more critical question is, how do you protect all of the town's assets, which are all of the property in the town, which is the economic engine for the town. And uh, are you people going to get involved in that part of the process? I'll get up again. Um, I think that would be something that we would So this outreach effort for next year is, is going to be targeted to decision makers and you know, town elected officials and, and town staff. But I think we're also going to have an element of public, public education and information. So that's what you're. That's really the best thing you can do through your CRS and really be beefing up the profile of this issue within the community, um, whether it's this commission or the, you know towns, other town staff. Um, getting the word out to property owners is really important. I think that's the best thing you can do to educate property owners. The other thing that the Coastal Commission uh, um, 
recommended was better state coordination. And so Senator Waters out of Dover, Durham, he um, put it through legislation last year and was approved that all state agencies have to review their policies, plans, and procedures to make sure that they're doing everything they can to incorporate the, informa the science-based information from that report. And that means the way they replace bridges and culverts and they, the way they maintain roads, including Route 1A. And so that the commission was really committed to state agencies working co collaboratively with municipalities to manage state and local assets together. It's, instead of doing, you, you take care of yours, we'll take care of ours. So there's going to be, I think, a more concerted effort to form those relationships and, f and form more dialogue between the municipalities and the state agencies that control their assets, whether it's the beach state park or the roadway system or cultural and historical assets or whatever it ends up being. And so it was a, it was a you know, the legislature says, yes, you need to do this. You know, this is about time you did it. It's long overdue. And I see a few smiles going on. I've, I've seen a few smiles about this very thing. And I think there's lots, lots of room for improvement with respect to that coordination and that, that, that those discussions that need to happen. But I think that the, the, the state and the agencies are committed to doing it now. And there's also an interagency work group on climate change that it, within the state of New Hampshire that's looking at ways to, looking at auditing the different policies, regulations, and procedures f within each department to make sure that they don't work against each other, that they work parallel to each other and complement each other. So that working group is, 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 has been meeting for about six months now, I think, and they're doing a really good job. I think that by the time they finish their, their preliminary stages of doing the audit, it's going to set the stage for those changes that the, uh, each department needs to make. And hopefully those departments will be communicating with their the constituents, the, you know, the municipalities in which they own property, especially in the coastal region, to try and work together to make the infrastructure better as a, as a whole. So I, I think that that process takes a, lo a while to unfold. It's a, lo it's a lot of work. It's a lot of a lot of research, um, but I think it's going to happen over the next few years. I think the de departments are definitely committed. I know the, that the, um, the new secretary of the Department of Trans Transportation is very committed to help making it happen. So, so in the right direction. Yeah, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you agree Hampton has kind of an advantage where the state has a park in the Hampton called Hampton Beach? Yes, That definitely. their emphasis, they have a lot of self-interest in this particular town, I would think they have a, they have an interest in any in any one of their assets that's a recreational or tourist destination that's in a, in an area that's susceptible to flooding. So that includes a lot of the parks in along Great Bay, other places mm -hmm. where the public landing sites and places in Rye parks, any one of those facilities because those facilities, I think you were at the presentation last night, mm -hmm. um, generate millions of dollars for the state that doesn't stay here in the coastal area. The entire state benefits from the, you know, the recreation and tourism dollars that are generated here on the coast. So they understand how important it is to the state economy. Um, and just the way of life of, of this, of, you know, the, the amenities that, that it provides when people from all over the state come to the coast to enjoy it. And so I, I think they, rec they finally, I shouldn't say finally, but I think that in light of new information and, and this, this commission that's opened, I think, people's eyes and, and gotten people to sit together to talk about this, to, what the need for this co cooperation, um, I think it's really going to change the way state agencies think about things. Um, I, I don't think that the average person understands how much, how much revenue the state gets from the coastal economy. And that's not just from recreation and tourism taxes and meals tax and rooms tax. It's, it's also, you know, the business dollars, people come in and spend money in, in businesses and buy equipment and rent things. And, uh, Believe so, me, we know. I, I know you know, but I think the average person probably doesn't appreciate it as much as you all do down here. Um, and I think that this report has really highlighted that, that very aspect. And, and so, so I think that, I think when the Senators uh, Waters and, and Stiles and Representative Rice and Representative um, Munn we're all working really hard in the legislature to get that message too, because they all vote as a block. But the person who's from the North Country might not appreciate the fact that they're getting a benefit from voting on something that only applies to the coast. So, over the last two to three years since this com the Coastal Commission existed, it, it sunsetted on December first. They fought that fight in the legislature to get them to realize that the, you know, the coast is, is such a driver, economic driver for the entire state. Because I don't think I just don't think that people were aware, aware of it. Um, so they garnered a lot of support, and every year they put forward either one or two pieces of legislation to chip away at 
these things, like the interagency co coordination and the, the interagency review or the departmental review of their practices. So I don't think without that dialogue and without those 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 representatives saying this and getting up and testifying to it, I don't think it would have su succeeded five years ago. So I think we've made progress. I think it's 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 slow progress, but I think we can look out over the last three years and look at this commission and look at the information and the you know the. The discussions that have gone on, and and, I, and the future legislation that's going to be coming forward, that will help push this ball forward. I think so. I think you can be hopeful that I think um, people actually look around the country. Our websites, our Coastal Commission report, and other things that we've done here in the, in the coastal region of New Hampshire to look at flooding issues and flood hazards are on websites all over the country. People point to us and say, "Look what they're doing. <laughs> this is really cool." Massachusetts, you know, looks at what we're doing. Maine looks at what we're doing. Yes. Huge, huge coastline. No, range. well, you know, and they, they, yes, and I know, and they, they, they chuckle a little bit about that. But actually, if you include the Great Bay, we have over 300 mi miles of, of coastline, or roughly that much. Um, but they do look at what the innovative things that we're doing, and they do re recognize that our small geography gives us a huge home court advantage, and that we have presence of federal agencies, and we, we just geographically can get together and convene and talk more often because we don't, we're not hundreds of miles away. But but I will say that New Hampshire really is a leader, and that I talked to you about that 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 NOAA grant that we got. We've successfully in the in the last consecutive four years gotten one or two grant awards from that nationally competitive program, titled you know totaling millions of dollars to support the work that we've done in the, in the coastal region here in New Hampshire. And all the other states are sort of like, God, they got it again, you know. <laughs> but we're doing really good stuff here, and so I, I hope you, you can appreciate you know that there are a lot of people working for you. And helping to bring these things forward and, and help to see progress on the coast to make make the, this coast um, better and stable and sustained, so that hopefully, uh, in, for 40 years, 30 years, we'll still have a nice viable, a viable coastline. Yeah, that's what it's all about, really. Yeah, and it might not look like it does today. It's gonna, you know, I think that the recognition is that things are gonna have to change a little bit. Conditions are gonna change, maybe, and we have to adapt to them. And things might not look and feel exactly the way they do today, but. That's that's progress. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much Thank for everything. You all of you. We really appreciate your time. It was extremely informative. Uh, Says two pages income generators. One is the Hampton. Yeah. Hampton's number one. Yeah. They can't let it drown. Some years it's the other way. But most years it's Not anymore. Not oh, since. No. I'm going to have to call them. Not since they have grades. Oh, really? Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right. So, uh, Kathy, yes. can we get some updates? I put down New Year's, but I also uh, I want to. I know you guys had a big uh, cleanup last week, yeah. according to my son. That was at Seabrook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all right. We, we cleaned the beach. Um, yeah. Wait till they come back in. Okay. All right. Well, again, I'm Kathy Silver from the Blue Ocean Discovery Center. And... Um, well, I guess backing up here, we really enjoyed being in the Christmas parade. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And um, we, um, we have ongoing cleanups all winter, beach cleanups. If anybody out there has the urge to clean a beach, um, we have an organized cleanup at Jenis Beach in Rye. Um, I think it's the first or the second Saturday of every month, and you can just go on our website, and there are other organized ones, too. Um, the one that Chuck's talking about was from my class at Winnicott High School. I had all my students go to Seabrook Beach last Thursday, and they learned how to officially clean a beach and do the tallying and the recording, and they've graphed the data from that. And so that's really important. It's one thing just to clean the beach, but the data is what's so important because we use that data, and I'll take this data that my students, and that gets forwarded to Blue Ocean as well. That data allows Blue Ocean to go to different organizations and to just anybody and 
there's a lot of power behind data. When you say, oh, we picked up a lot of cigarette butts, that's one thing. When you say, let me see if I can get the number right. Uh, yeah, last, Saturday, last Thursday, we picked up 691 cigarette butts in the area between Eastman Stock and the co-op on Seabrook Beach. That was like, it was pretty cold. The kids could only be out for 25 minutes. That was like 60 kids, 20 minutes working. 691 cigarette butts in December. <laughs> okay. Nothing like free help that is productive. Yeah, well, <laughs> they got a grade. Like okay. They got a grade. They got a grade. Well, they had to write the, they're all writing the paper on it. Um, but, you know, if you say, oh, gee, there must be a lot of cigarette butts out here. Or like when I told you a while ago that um, I had kids from the Discovery Center, the summer program, clean the playground. We picked up a lot of cigarette butts. But when I tell you it was 170 in just a few minutes, I mean, in an area that smoking is not allowed, I mean, see, the numbers are very, very powerful. So that's why the recording is so helpful. And we're um, emphasizing right now this whole, this is kind of a new idea, um, it's called tiny trash or microplastics, because plastic doesn't biodegrade, but it photodegrades by the sun, and it really never goes away. And so you might look at the sand and say, oh, there's really nothing there. This is a clean beach. But once you sift it and look at it, there's all these little pieces that animals ingest, and it gets into the environment that way. And so that's, that's a, a, another avenue that we're working in. So that's our winter stuff. Okay. And that goes on all the time. And this is when the Discovery Center is officially like not open every day. But we'll remind you. Discovery Center is open for birthday parties and school groups, and the animals are there. Hey, we go in um, several times a week to feed them, and um, you know we can open up at any time. So they're there. Our big thing in, for the future, our meaning our Hampton Beach Village District and us is New Year's Eve, and we will open our doors from seven to nine, and we'll have food and hot drinks available, and we're working out the details. But, um, and we'd like to invite everybody to come in. Okay, it's free, open to the public. And the fireworks go off at 8.30, I believe? 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, okay, 8 o'clock. And there's all sorts of things. So Hampton Beach on New Year's Eve is the place to be. Yes. We're also looking at some type of entertainment. So, right, uh, there's, there's a lot going on that night. We're firming up all the details, but absolutely. New Year's Eve is the place to be. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And the cost? Free. It's free, absolutely. I mean, this do is well here in Hampton Beach. Yes, this is um, the village, the village district's gift. That's why I, that's why I talk about it. The village district's gift to the people, yeah. and we're happy to be part of that. Great. Okay. So New Year's Eve. Okay. Thank you for all you do. Okay. 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 Any old business, Maureen? Parade. It was a great <laughs> parade. We had a lovely time. It was, was uh, we had quite a group. We had not only um, the Continentals on the wagon, driven by brilliantly <laughs> <laughs> by our entertainment coordinator. I was driving the village district truck. Yes, you were. No, you were driving my truck. <laughs> I paid for. Please don't say that. Uh, <laughs> TV. And then the Blue Ocean, of course, you people were involved. And we had a, a, one of my neighbors who had the antique car. Yeah. And I think I'm missing two. Who am I missing? Richard Renier. Richard. Mm -hmm. And Richard and Miss Hampton, Hampton Beach, Beach and Little Miss Hampton Beach. And yeah. it was lot, I thought it worked well. So Hampton Beach was well represented. Mm -hmm. Nice big section. Yeah. That's good. And it's the second largest parade in New Hampshire. That was big. Christmas yeah. parade. Yeah. yeah. It was big. Yeah, Christmas parade. Yeah. Second largest Christmas parade. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Let's yeah. try to make it the largest now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should. Well, we should. Uh, it's the goal. It's the goal. Yeah. Get next year. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Three, three bands <laughs> shot at first place. Yeah, we'll have to find out how close we are. <laughs> we'll get our kazoos out. It's a pretty chilly day out there, though, I think, for a lot of them. Yeah. Observers of the citizens standing along the side a little bit. It's pretty cool. I didn't see anyone complaining. No. Some weren't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing to complain about. All right. 
I'm sure you must have to talk about the uh, coloring, coloring book. book. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost God, yes. yes, we are going this to read the most print. talked about thing that we do. <laughs> I just want to tell you, I know you make fun, but I, I have received so many, po so much positive input from people on the beach, residents of the beach, who talk about how important that coloring book is to them. So, I anyway. think it's great. Um, we are going to reprint. We haven't quite decided how many we feel we're going to reprint, though. Have we decided? We haven't really decided yet. It's kind of up to you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll maybe we could make that decision. How much money we have left? I well, know. We, you have to make a decision tonight. All right then. All right. And yes, we no. have one of our choices again. Two twenty-two hundred, five thousand, or ten thousand. Okay. At a cost of either four thousand three seventy-five. Or six thousand three forty one, or nine thousand seven forty eight. So Why is there not such a? What was the what were the three choices of not the dollar amount? Twenty two thousand, roughly two thousand five thousand and ten thousand. The cost per book uh, for two thousand is a dollar ninety nine. Yeah. The cost for five thousand per book is a dollar twenty six. For Ten thousand, it's ninety-eight cents. Wow. The problem with ten thousand is a storage problem. Yeah. Uh, if if I think I'm leaning toward five thousand copies, if I were making a recommendation, okay, that's probably a storage. Yeah. 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 I mean, we'll find a place <laughs> to do it. I think another Where's thing we need to general? consider is <laughs> oh, you is, don't need uh, we, what we're going to do with them. I think we're going to expand our. That's, that's a, again and entirely. To you. Secondly, yeah, what we're going to do with them. And perhaps if there is ever a need to change again, or add or subtract, do we want to have ten thousand? I don't I think, think so. I think five is a good number. I do too. I I would like to see this book grow. I think there's room for it. I know, and that's why I hate to do ten thousand and have you that's want it to grow. How many years so. do we get? Does five thousand work? Of course. Two. A couple of years. Two or three. Two or three. three years. How many? One. Three years. How many years will I would we guess get out of probably 5, more than that, but it depends on how you use it. I wouldn't go right. more than five thousand, and I think we should. I, would, I mean, I really don't want to. It, do any it's more also a, a marketing piece. Yes. I mean, it's a coloring book, but it's a. It really is a wonderful marketing tool. Yeah. And, do and you only give them away during Children's Week? No. <laughs> That's no. The I've problem. been no. I've been known to give them away sitting in a restaurant yeah, when I right. see kids beside me. I have been known. I think it's, you know. We've given them to the uh, kindergarten kids yeah, before. But they're not in the Chamber of Commerce office. No, no. There. Well, there are some. No. There are but some they, do, they do that. They do it too, don't they? Doesn't yeah, she do it? I, I mean, on an individual but basis. You know, it's a, but basically, it's they're here and they're in my the house. The original in your intent house. was to have a prize to give every child at the conclusion of the event. And we do that. And they get the eight count Crayola crayons. <laughs> is that the, the lowest single box? <laughs> <laughs> I think they got some 12s There is a four pack. Yes, there is. <laughs> there is a four. I think, they, I think four some of them got 12s and 24s because they were. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, that's but to answer your question, though, I, I there are other uh, times that we give them out to. And, and we gave them to. Uh, oh, do we give them to Sacred Hat yet? Then we give it to the schools. I like, to, uh, in the, and I'd like to take some of the ones that we have now, and give them to the uh, the center school has K in one. Yes. That, yeah. Yes. I'd like to give them to to them. There's you know? some and people. And I'd also like to give them to some of the restaurants. Some so people are saying there's going to be a wow of a centerfold in this new coloring book. Yes, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you the people saying that? Uh, it's, well, I heard that. I have heard that? talking about. You know, Maureen, if you're going to do that, it might be nice to do it just before Christmas. You could give them to them, and the kids could it'd be like a little Christmas present. We've got, we've got what, three boxes still, which would be 300, which is probably enough for the. I, yeah, I wonder how many kids are in the center school. I, I bet have... you we've got close to giving enough for each kid. I bet we do. Yeah, we, we have get that many. We have Maybe just under some, yeah. three boxes here. You for have some, Year's don't you, anyway? All the little kids. Oh, it'd be good for New Year's Eve. Oh, you New should Year's have Eve. some. New Year's Eve, I could give a lot. Yeah, we should yes. do. Yes, we we'll get happy kids. to do that. Let's do it for I New Year's and then we'll and, and not do the school shit. Because okay. because the kids get so much stuff at Christmas. Five thousand. I'd like to make a motion that we do five thousand copies. All those in favor? 
bump. Okay, five thousand. Amen. That's a bump time. Comment. Yes. Um, you, I was a recipient of one of your free books, and you gave it to me last year. Yep. And I have a very close friend who's special needs, and he got into that thing because he he won't go on the sand, or won't go to the beach. And he thought it was phenomenal. Um, then, unfortunately, his mother said she wanted one. So, luckily, you give me two. So, I gave her my copy. But oh, well, you, did you, for, are you asking for, for a copy? You can yeah, have, right there. You can have as many copies yeah, as you would yeah, like to have. This saying. isn't the budget committee. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Things like this, that, you know, is great for kids, yeah. you know, that maybe can't get to the beach or have needs, and I think this is a phenomenal idea. Yeah. And I do too, yeah, Brian. To all of you. <laughs> I just thought I'd show it. All right, and the thank other you very much for that. Thank and you need any more of those? You want kicking it off. Yes, we have to thank Eileen yeah, Tabool. Yeah, huh? Have to thank Eileen Tabool. Yeah. She she started the she. she this started is this not the, this thirty is not years an ago. Original idea. We did it fifteen years ago, but it was nowhere ago. near as as good as this. Exactly. One. <laughs> Moving along, yes. and yes, Eileen was okay. very instrumental and, in helping uh, me too yeah. with ideas to us. I think we're we calling this. that out pretty good. We got Me. bumper stickers coming. And Denise Jesus. Brown, who's yep. going to we do got, the read? We got bumper stickers coming. Five thousand or ten thousand? No, fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Basically, we actually you get more in a box. Huh? Yeah. You uh, we actually have to pull them back a little bit towards the end of the year to make sure that we have plenty of them for Children's Week. We okay. we uh, give them all out. Okay, good. What are they going to say? Are they going to wait for the contest? So contest. To ask me that. Make something up. It doesn't. No, no, no. It's it's, it's all me. Oh, Hampton Beach is a great beach and a whole lot more. <laughs> there you go. Good. No, um, the kids make up the uh, theme on Children's Week. They do it. We use no. whatever they do, and that's when we give them the winner, the, the one who gets the bicycle. Yeah. So does the, the theme. last year's winner is this year's theme. Absolutely. Right. What is the theme? Hampton Beach is a great beach and a whole lot more. Oh, it is not. That was like mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> is that the best you could say? Some are better than others. Some are, <laughs> some are home, some are not. Okay. It's a happening beach. Yeah. yeah, I know you like that one. Seaman. <laughs> Which one is that? Hampton Beach is happening. That's no, it was a Hamptoning beach. beach. Hamptoning Beach it was, was terrible. Oh. <laughs> he picked that one out several years ago. That's why you can't pick them on anymore. Okay. <laughs> Sure. All right. Okay, now what? Bob, any uh, old no, business? No, I'm... Any new business? No. Maureen, any new business? I don't think so. Except that I do hope... He hasn't showed up yet. I have to call him. I hope everybody will come out New Year's Eve. Yeah. Get on your mufflers and your, yeah. you know, your warm coats and come out because it's going to be nice. We're, we're trying to expand that. Um, yeah. And hopefully it will be not too cold. But uh, didn't you promise several chimeneas if it's freezing? <laughs> no, we did not. I don't think it's in the budget. <laughs> we'll have to check uh, on that one. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to approve uh, minutes from October 12th and November 9th. I have a motion to accept them as written. I'll so move. A second. All in favor? Wow. That was easy. Okay. Public comment. Anybody? Not that we don't let every, anybody just talk at any time. <laughs> There's no structure. <laughs> uh, closing comments. For you. Well, I guess Merry Christmas is in order. Happy holidays. Okay. Happy New Year, everyone. Please come out for the uh, the uh, wonderful. Uh, this, what does it snow? This, the shower of light that's going to be on the stage as well. Are we? Yes, the shower, yeah. those shower light thing. We have one of those. And now. The, uh, they're going to be open upstairs on the. Uh, oh, they are. The state will be open, and they. Are, what are they having? A reception with Hello? some a buff and some, okay, yeah, so some stuff. You can go uh, there, and you can come to the Blue Ocean and get a cup of cocoa and visit the state listen to the band and yes, cookies. Cookies. And a oh, coloring book. Yeah. There you go. While supplies last. No promises that they'll all be there. 
Because there's a lot of people come out from these. Oh, get some over there. All right. Bob, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Just in the spirit of the season, be good to each other. Amen. 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 That's right. All right. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays. Everything. Swanza. Kwanzaa. 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 There you go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Happy New Year. 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 Happ